Hi, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar. It's time to dismantle white supremacy in the food movement, hosted by FoodShare and Food Network Canada. I'm Karan Liu, the Toronto-based culture reporter for the Toronto Star. I used to be the food writer and recipe tester, but then uh, COVID happened and our test kitchen closed. So Uncle Karan was given a new beat. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging the sacred land that I and some of you out there are located on. It is the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabeg and the Haudenosaunee allied nations to peacefully share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. The organizers at FoodShare and the Food Network recognize the many nations of Indigenous people who presently live on this land, who have spent time here, and whose ancestors have hunted and gathered on this land. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited about this panel um, because I've, I've written about FoodShare a few times before at the Star and their initiatives to provide food security to marginalized and at-risk communities in my city, and I've also attended their food events, which are so much fun. And fun fact, the last food thing that I attended was uh, Food Share's Recipe for Change in late February before everything. Um, just some housekeeping things before we start. I've been told that if you want to post about this uh, discussion on social media, please use the hashtag and white supremacy and please tag at foodshareto and at Food Network CA so that we can continue this conversation online. We also have two interpreters from the Toronto Sign Language Interpreter Service who will be providing ASL interpretation for today's panel. So thank you. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, one of the mandates of FoodShare is to dismantle systemic forms of oppression within the food systems and beyond. Uh, for those who are familiar with FoodShare, the organization literally came out with a dismantling white supremacy food box that contains produce grown by BIPOC, which means Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, led or owned farms. So its goals are very clear. Uh, we'll be expanding on that conversation today on dismantling white supremacy within various food systems. I'm pleased to be joined by a group of incredible uh, leaders from three different countries and uh, two different time zones for today's discussion. Uh, that's all. Everyone's going to turn on the comments now. Okay, so first of all, uh, we have uh, Don Morrison, Indigenous food sovereignty activist. Hello. And then I'm just going down the list of everyone. Uh, Noam Olisi Mate, who is joining us from Johannesburg at a time when I would be normally getting ready for bed. So thank you very much for uh, joining us this evening for you. Uh, she's a farmer and a co-owner and, uh, and founder of a women's organic farming co-op in Poutfontaine, a village east of Johannesburg. And then we also have Saeed Hussein, uh, executive director of the Toronto-based Migrant Workers Alliance. Uh, we have Roger Mooking, Toronto-based chef and Food Network Canada TV host. And I'm going to add musician for all the Canadian millennials who have tuned in. Um, bass is bass forever. Um, <laughs> yay. And we have uh, Rich Pirog, Michigan State University Center for Regional Food Systems and a member of the National Racial Equity in the Food System Work Group. So thank you all for joining us today. And um, it feels great to wear something other than a dirty t-shirt uh, for the first time in six months. So um, let's get started. I just wanna start off with uh, a general question for everyone. So we can kind of go down the, the list and everyone can kind of take their turns um, answering. When we talk about white supremacy, it means recognizing that there is a privilege that white people currently and historically have over BIPOC folks, which stands for black indigenous people of color. For everyone on the panel, how does white supremacy show up in the work that you do? Um, I'll start with whoever's next to my square, my Zoom thing. So let's go with Said first. 
Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. So, I mean, white supremacy, as you said, is about privilege, but it's also about systems and structures. And so in our work, where it shows up the most is when we talk about immigration policy. You know, Canada, often people think about as a multicultural nation, which is very welcoming, but one in 23 people in the country uh, don't have permanent resident status, which means they don't have equal rights. They don't have the ability to access basic um, services to speak back against a bad boss. And as we saw during COVID-19, uh, we saw that there has been 1,200 farm workers just in this one province who've contracted COVID-19. Three have now died uh, already. Uh, and many others are in SEC or in ICU. Uh, during this time, they were not able to leave their farm, weren't able to speak back. And the fundamental reason they weren't able to do this is because they're denied citizenship rights. And I know that this is happening the world over where migrant workers are treated um, with fewer rights. And it is how white supremacy functions here uh, because the rights of citizenship by and, by and large are provided more to white people or to people who have more economic power. Um, so really for us, that's what it's about. It's about how immigration policy is impacting racialized people uh, and killing us. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Roger, how has, white supremacy kind of shown up or is evident in your field? Uh, my feeling, I mean, like you mentioned, I do music, but also as pertinent to this discussion, I do a lot of stuff in food media, um, working with publications, magazines, working with uh, media companies, broadcasters, uh, across the media landscape internationally. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, just today I was on a call and it's a, perpetual battle of framing the reference of content. So companies will come to me, for instance, in the food media or retailing landscape, and they'll say, we like you, you have a, a, a very specific perspective, you have a global focus on your cuisine, we wanna integrate some of your, um, your global perspective on what your perspective is in the voice of this conversation. And I have to tell you 99.99% of the time, I will present ideas across the spectrum of the same things that they, they come to me for, you know, this global representation and uh, all this, all of this different cuisines um, that, I, that I've learned over the years. And inevitably by the end of the campaign, we're making a hamburger. <laughs> we're making a, a version of macaroni and cheese. Uh, we're making a pizza. Right? right? And it's mind numbingly frustrating. I've been doing this for like 30 years in the entertainment industry in food media, very specifically a solid 15 years. And I haven't seen one thing change. Like I said, I was on a call today where that was the conversation, right? right. Oh, the client likes this and blah, blah. Okay, that's cool, that's cool. But why'd you call me? <laughs> Don't call me, call you know, somebody else. There's lots of people who can make a hamburger for you or pizza. You're not hitting you up for some Trinidadian expertise. <laughs> so a lot of times it, you get this token representation of um, here's this, this person of color, here's this black person, we're putting this campaign with them, but we say we want their voice, but we don't really want their voice. We want them to look like they do, but do what we do. And that is by definition, <laughs> this whole discussion, right? Yeah. So I, I, I deal with this perpetually with every single point of contact. And I fight it every single time. <laughs> and then uh, jumping south of the equator to Noam Alisti, uh, how has white supremacy kind of, how is it evident in agriculture and the work that you do? Ooh, I don't even know where to start, but um, just uh, briefly, you know, I'll go into the land issue. You know, the fact that uh, we are in, we are 26 years into democracy and we, things are supposed to be, you know, back to where they should be, you know, we having access to land, it's not like that. Um, so that on its own, you know, has created you no know, this kind of mentality or mindset that we're just laborers. You know, we never look at 
a farming as a business, like we should, or like we should be looking at it as a business. And, um, you know, you, you find that many a time we don't have that qualification and the know-how in agriculture. And secondly, the economic system, whew, there, there are so many barriers, you know, so that uh, when you have managed to get into the farming as such, you find that there are so many barriers, starting with uh, the infrastructure, because you don't have the money to mm. get the infrastructure, which is key these days, insofar as agriculture is concerned. Everything is just so expensive. And if you don't have land, which you can use as a collateral, then it becomes impossible for you to move forward. And then also, it means then you don't have any financial resources to get to wherever you want to get to, insofar as uh, agriculture is concerned. Then, say you make it to wherever with the little that you have, then you have a problem with markets. You find that um, the, way, the businesses or the retailers or the processors are owned by the whites. And uh, they don't buy from you as a small farmer. If they do, they will take this and that. They will never get into a contract with you to say, um, I need so much of your tomatoes uh, weekly or something like that. And uh, you find that you, you end up, you know, getting into the informal sector, which is very difficult because many a time it's very inconsistent. Their excuse is always, I mean, we can't give you a contract because you're small and uh, you won't be consistent in supplying us with whatever it is that we need. And uh, that takes us back to even the land that you have, sometimes it's just not enough and it's very difficult to access land. So without land, and uh, it means you don't have money to farm, to go to wherever you want to. And whenever, even if you have managed to get there, there is no market. You don't have any consistent market that can, where you can say, no, then I'm all right. You can, you can do whatever. And uh, when natural disasters like hailstorms and everything come, you don't even, you have not even had the money to insure your crop and your little infrastructure that you have. So you have to start from zero again. Yeah. That's the difficulty that we have. Yeah. I feel like you just gave us like the table of contents of like a book that you could write about all the systemic issues that are facing black farmers <laughs> <laughs> around the world. So. I, I know that you have a lot to to um, to get mm. through, so hopefully we'll have enough uh, time within the next hour to 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 somewhat scratch the surface of it. And then, um, Don, what about you? In the work that you do, um, how does white supremacy fit into to all of this? Well, um, there's again many ways, but I'll start with, um, I guess, going back to the time of colonization when the um, agrarianism was first imposed in uh, the westernmost uh, region of so called Canada, where there are 27 nations of Indigenous peoples who inhabit um, um, this, this part of the, the, um, the nation state of Canada. And uh, we here are for the uh, most part are sovereign and we've never ceded the land. Uh, we've never surrendered. And we persist in some of the most sustainable adaptation strategies of humanity and hunting and gathering societies. We still, um, many families still rely on a subsistence economy. It's not about capitalism. It's not about money. It's not about a a market economy or a productionist um, intensifying production. It's about extensifying um, on a really broad ecological and cultural scope and scale. And that narrative has been made essentially invisible in food systems policy and food systems discourse. And, you know, the, the land was essentially stolen. Um, indigenous peoples in so-called Canada, um, 
have only uh, access to 0.2% of all the land base. Yet worldwide, Indigenous peoples maintain 22% of the land surface in terms of biodiversity and cultural heritage. Uh, the contributions we've made to even agriculture, which in was only imposed here in BC um, 150 years ago. Um, so it's a relatively a baby of a system compared to the thousands of years that our ancestors have lived here. And yet where we fight to get scraps in whether it's funding circles, whether it's in um, policy recognition, um, the truth and reconciliation that's been proclaimed by various levels of government has not been meaningful because there, we cannot reconcile in the same framework that was designed to dispossess us with an illegal doctrine that was established, first established in the late 1880s to take the water and the land. And so that's kind of the biggest way we're still fighting to, to, be, to have our narrative and our voices and our vision and to reclaim that. And um, I think we see a lot of other disparity in the system um, where indigenous peoples experience three to four times the national average of food insecurity. Um, that's glaring that the system doesn't work for us as indigenous peoples. Um, and we see that, um, you know, there's a, there's a really uh, big, beautiful movement uh, happening within um, white settler, white society to grow organic food and, you know, even agroecology and looking at um, some the regenerative farming movement. And while that's really important to be able to minimize the ecological impact that agriculture has had here, um, it's still very much not centering an indigenous experience and still very much um, making the agri-food system work better for for a lot of white people who can afford to buy expensive organic food and where indigenous peoples are overrepresented in some of the most food insecure and um, poverty stricken neighborhoods in both rural and urban areas. So there's many, many more. I mean, the fact that um, white settler farmers are able to consolidate huge tracts of land and water, extract huge amounts of water from our waterways where our wild salmon, our most important indigenous food has, is, is endangered, um, has literally gone from millions to a mere hundred because of the multiple uh, cumulative factors in the system that has led to the, the endangerment of this really precious source of protein. Um, but the, the, the system favors the the white settler farmers to be able to consolidate the land, the water, um, and to be able to grow huge amounts of uh, food for global export rather than for food sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there because um, I know that there's more, but those are the main things that come from. Sure. I see a, a lot of overlap between the, the issues that you raised on and the issues that Noam Holisi raised in terms of land ownership, uh, the legacy of colonialism, and uh, it, just access to food, food security. So it kind of shows just how globally per pervasive this is and just how deeply entrenched it is. And now kind of shifting gears um, uh, from more of a, I guess, from the more academic world, Rich, uh, how has how has white supremacy kind of uh, affected the work that you do and how how do you, I guess, relate to it or how does it affect the type of research that you do? Well, um, Karan, I, uh, following the, the comments of Dawn and uh, the fact that I've spent a good part of my career in what's called the land grant system in the United States, and the system is based on the stealing of land. In 1862, the Morrill Act was passed and uh, land was taken from uh, Native uh, people in what has now become the United States. And uh, 
that is how the system is, has been based. There's a, a piece that was done by High Plains Journal uh, Land Grab Universities that came out in April that uh, I can put a link into the chat pod that would be particularly uh, of, of interest, I would think. But it, the, the story has, has, is, is, continues to have many layers here in the United States when we talk about that academic and public education and the fact that the, those 1862, that was the year the law passed, land grants, you know, they, they, those institutions, including the one that I, you know, I work now and the others I previously had worked for, were built to, to serve white people. And uh, in 1890, when they created the system for what are called historically black colleges and universities, and then in 1994, when they created the system uh, to uh, create what is now uh, called tribal colleges and universities in the United States, the disparities between those, those land grant systems remain huge. And just, a, just a, one quick example, uh, the federal act that created what's called the Cooperative Extension Service, uh, the, the county agent in the United States in 1914, um, the extension funding for the uh, historically black colleges and universities, even though they were created in 1890, that funding didn't come into to place until 1977. Mm -hmm. So I wanna get back to uh, Don, the issue of, um, the, the term food sovereignty kind of gets brought up a lot, particularly when it comes to black food sovereignty and indigenous food sovereignty. Could you explain what food sovereignty means for indigenous communities and what needs to be done to advance it? Yes, uh, thank you. So what, I'm, what I uh, share is uh, basically a description um, based on how I've uh, literally conversations with thousands of indigenous peoples and how they've shaped my thinking. And, and I always try my best to, to honor that sacred trust that people have entrusted with me in terms of how it's being expressed in indigenous communities, um, which because indigenous cultures and worldviews, um, there's a different paradigm underlying our culture and our worldview. So I don't describe it in the same way that it gets food sovereignty gets described, say, for, for example, within the Via Campesina or the World Food Summit or the places where food sovereignty was first introduced back in the, light, uh, the late 1990s. Um, so rather than defining it as having control over our food system, um, which is a direct contradiction to indigenous worldview that we don't control the land or the food. We don't control nature. We control ourselves in relation to it. So um, rather than having control over our food system, we think of it as um, now it, within these four key principles. And I, I won't go into them in detail because I don't want to hog the time, but um, the first one is the sacred gift of food, um, the act of working with nature and the, the gifts that it has given us and looking at food as the most tra transformative thing that we do every single day. We eat the food and it becomes us. There's nothing more transformative that we do every day. Our bodies turn the food into us and we use that energy and it transforms all kinds of things in the world through the energy that transforms. Um, there's also the sacred res uh, responsibility that comes with that, to be in right relationship with the land, the water, the people, the plants, the animals, and to follow our original instructions that we were given as indigenous people, as people of the earth. Um, our original instructions are to be in right relationship and, and to, to be a part of that sacred life force that makes our heart beat and our lungs breathe involuntarily. It's a, it's a very sacred trust. Um, the second principle is the participatory action-oriented nature of food sovereignty. We cannot achieve food sovereignty by waiting for a corporation or a market or anybody else to achieve it for us. We must participate every day in some sort of indigenous hunting, fishing, farming, gathering, sharing, trading, preparing food, 
and we must teach our children how to do that. The third principle is self-determination. So self-determination um, in, uh, in the context, a uh, high cultural context of a web of relationships. So it's not self-determination as individualism or just worrying about oneself. It's worrying about oneself in the context of our, all our relations, the tribal values, taking care of ourselves so that we can take better take care of others and give to the collective health and well-being of the whole. You could even think of self-determination in the context of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples at the international scale um, that lays out self-determination really well in relationship to nation states. The fourth principle is decolonizing policy. So we know that food sovereignty can only be achieved in practice on the ground, but it is being impacted by colonial policy. So we need to be able to decolonize and dismantle those um, uh, structural um, structures and processes um, for policy, um, planning and governance um, over the land and the food system. And so that's, um, you know, and in a nutshell, it's the ability to respond to our own needs for food um, for and by Indigenous peoples. And, um, but we know that that's a transition and we're all related um, to people of all colors. So really it's, um, yeah, that's maybe not so short of a definition, but there it is. Yeah, I and mean, what needs to be done to kind of advance it? it? It seems that there has to be like very big structural changes uh, in order to ensure these principles are kind of put into action. Yeah. It really comes down to honoring the agreements that were made 100 years ago <laughs> and just honoring the agreements, right? Let's start there, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and Roger, we kind of talked about this before when I interviewed you um, a few months ago on um, systemic problems within the hospitality um, industry because, you know, you've been working as a professional uh, chef and <laughs> restaurant owner for a while now to kind of shift gears from the more agriculture to the hospitality industry, what are things that the restaurant industry and specifically restaurant owners, what can and what should they do to make it a more safer and more equitable workplace for, you know, BIPOC folks? I think, you know, the most rudimentary thing that can happen is just representation across all levels of the industry, right? So when I came to Toronto in the 1990s, uh, the kitchens were populated primarily by Sri Lankan immigrant workers who were working for very cheap hourly wages. And all of the managers, all of the executives and all of the owners were not from that demographic. Right. Um, so there's a very clear, specific split in in, uh, in responsibility and and earnings. Right. So uh, moving beyond the 90s, you start to see uh, a little bit more diversity coming in. You know, the Food Network pops up, and all of a sudden, it's like all these white kids who their parents wanted them to be doctors and lawyers, and we're putting them on a trajectory to do that stuff. All of a sudden, you can become a celebrity and you, you uh, gain a lot of notoriety for being a chef. So where nobody wanted to be a chef in the 70s and 80s, all of a sudden you have this wave of people who want to be chefs. And now all the kitchens who were once populated by Sri Lankan workers um, in, at, at, at the cooks and dishwashing levels and all that stuff, all of a sudden you see a wave of all of these white kids now who want to get, get famous and you do all this stuff and blah, 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 right? So you start to see that shift shift in, in the, the dynamic of the, the demographics of the people working in the, in the op operations. But at that time, even still, uh, for me, I was one of very few owner operators and chefs uh, coming up in the mix still. But at that time, particularly, very, very, very few of us uh, are representing, right? So I think it is very important that people see themselves in the positions you know, um, as the owner, as the 
director of food and beverage, as the executive chef, as the front of house managers, as well as being the dishwashers, the representation across the board that actually represents something that looks like the, the industry or the population at large um, is very significant. You know, I don't think people, people say, what did Obama do? What did Obama do? You know what? Obama let people like me think that I could be Obama. <laughs> for the very first time, right? So it's a very, very important thing. It's a role model thing, right? And, and we have to create that modeling. Um, we see the value of modeling when it comes to people who say they don't wanna wear a mask and what happens with that. Modeling is very, very important and cannot be underestimated. I, I mean, I could continue, but let's just start there on the most rudimentary level, right? Right. And I think when you talk about representation, a big part of it is putting, um, you know, Black or Indigenous or people of color, people, putting those people in leadership and decision making roles, people who have the power to institute policies and to make actual tangible changes. Um, which I think is why you used Obama as an example, as someone who has the ability to make these changes and to be in a leadership role in order to make positive changes, right? Sort of, maybe. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, and that's the point is once you're there, you know, and it's also about just voices at the table offering a perspective, right? I'll give you an example. When I was first doing my very first show for Food Network Canada called Everyday Exotic, I was working with a production company, very nice, great people at the production company. A couple of people at the production company just didn't come from a, a background that, that I was familiar with, right? So but the concept of the show was taking everyday foods and making them unique and interesting by adding one ingredient that people may find intimidating, whether that be coriander, star anise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And uh, when I was doing that uh, deal, I was very insistent about having a voice at the table. Yes, I could be the host and I could refuse to do something like this. I'm not gonna do that, right? But, but that only gets you so far. So with that show, I insist I was consulting producer, I'm the co-creator, I'm doing, the, I'm the host of the show, all these things. So when four months before we start filming one episode of the show, what do the recipes look like? Where's the, the history of these recipes coming from? What is the passion behind these recipes? Uh, why do we do this recipe? What is the lineage of this, of this thing that we're trying to do and present to the people? And wh why are we trying to draw in, in, in uh, references from Indonesia or Trinidad or... My whole point, the food was just a, a vessel a, by proxy to be able to squeeze people's minds around the fact that there's a world larger out there for them to participate in, right? But I wasn't able, I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't have a voice at the producer table four months before we start even shooting a drop of, of the show. And so you're right, exactly. If I didn't have the voice at that table, none of that stuff would have happened. Right. We would have went and just made another hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> we would have made some French fries and put some cumin on it or like, yeah. you know, like, you know what I mean? Like, you have to have that voice at the table and it's just a matter of perspectives. You know, my team, there's like a black woman, there's a Polish woman, there's a, a Jewish person, there's a Chinese person. And there's like, it's across the diaspora and I've built it that way for a reason because I want to have as many perspectives, thoughts and ideas when we're considering doing anything or brainstorming anything to be able to put into the mix. And those voices have to be at the table in a decision making and and uh, I guess a legislative function, you know? Yeah, and I think speaking of, I think power seems to be like a, a predominant theme uh, and the ability to have your voice heard and to have some sort of tangible impact seems to be um, a recurring theme in all of the fields of uh, all five of our panelists. I mean, let's move back on to the issue of land ownership. So this question is for Noam Olesi. Um, I was looking at the data for race-based ownership, race-based land ownership in South Africa. Um, in 2017, a land audit report from the Rural 
Development and Land Reform Department put up by the South African government found that when it comes to privately owned farming and agricultural land, 72% of it is owned by white folks, while 4% is owned by black folks. Um, just to give some context, the latest population count released by the government just mm -hmm. this last month says that white folks make up just under 8% of the country's population, while black folks make up for 81%. So that's a pretty big disparity there. Um, so uh, you kind of touched on this uh, during the intro free for all question. Is this the legacy of you know, apartheid affecting black food sovereignty or did it start way before that, before those 26 years ago? It has, I would say, um, like you, I mean, like I said before, you know, this land access, it means so much. It means identity, it means who you are, it means health, wealth, and power. So if you don't have access to land or to enough land, definitely we're going to depend on those that have land. And mm. I mean, when you depend on those, they're going to feed you, they're going to make you do whatever they want you to do because you're dependent on them for everything that you need. So this inequality, food sovereignty and all that, everything is just locked in this white sovereignty. So even when you have the little bit that you have, I mean, it, it doesn't mean much really. It, it, there's very little that you can do to move forward. So, you know, the legacy of apartheid is still there. Mm -hmm. And it will be there for a long time. It has given them power. And the power that they have is not just in food or in agriculture or anything. Even when you need to move, you have to go to them for, uh, 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 for funding, okay? And uh, you need something that you can give, you know? And sometimes you find that even if you have, um, the little that you have, but it depends on who you are. You can go together uh, with a white person because, I mean, they own the banks, they own these, you know, big companies. But because you're black, you won't get the same thing. You may find that they, even the, 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 the percentage that you have to pay as interest because you're black, it's got to be more, you know. So this legacy really is there and it's it's going to continue until such time that things are moved the other way. Because, like I said, land, especially as a farmer, means everything. There is very little that I can do if I have very little land. And that's, the, that's what is happening with black farmers. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I mean, land ownership is power. It's money. It's, yeah. you know, it, yeah. it, it, it's everything. And then, you know, yes. for kind of continuing on with the subject of agriculture, Saeed, you know, you and I have never spoken before, but my colleagues at the Star are very familiar with you. You've been interviewed by my colleagues quite a few times for uh, the paper's ongoing coverage of uh, migrant workers and seasonal agricultural workers, especially during COVID. Um, you know, the Star has written about the outbreaks um, among workers in the Windsor Essex area, uh, the living conditions, lack of access to health care, lack of labor rights, lack of resident status, the list just goes on and on and on. Um, so when you talk to migrant workers, you know, what do they want to see to happen? You know, policy changes, interventions from government, you know, what do they want to see happen now amidst the pandemic and as well as, you know, longer term? once this is over. Yeah, I want to I start where Nam just left off, you know, because when we talk about uh, what happens to people around the world when they don't have access to the land, that's when they're forced to become migrant workers in the global north, right? So the displacement of our people from the Caribbean, Latin America, you know, Southern Africa, and I mean, it's not just happening to the north. I mean, there's Zimbabwean farm workers is in South Africa and who are another layer of migrant workers. So we are seeing this global displacement. And simultaneously, there's the consolidation of food that we need to really understand here. You know, right now in Canada, there are only five supermarkets uh, chains that control 95% of all food sales. Right. There is one company, Cargill, that controls 85% of the meat that is produced and sold here. We are talking about um, 
you know, the fact that uh, Canada is the world's sixth largest agri-food exporter. This is a country where migrants are displaced from around the world as a result of white supremacist capitalism that arrive here and then face, uh, and, and, as, and these are many of them are indigenous people from Southern America displaced first from there now here. And now we are in this position where they are themselves being utilized in, a, in the next wave of displacement and colonization. And it is a very complex set of issues that our people are facing. And in this moment, um, you know, migrant farm workers grow the majority of the food in this country, right? The majority of the food, if you've eaten a pear or a grape or drank a glass of wine, a migrant worker grew it. And as you know, as our comrades have said in the Via Campesina and others that were referenced earlier, land must be for the tiller. And here it's not. In fact, you have nothing. You don't even have the ability to get healthcare, as you said. Um, decent housing, you people are living in shacks, separated by cardboard. Uh, if you speak up, you complain, you get deported, you can't come back, you don't have access to income. And the entire conversation on food has actually completely excised the question of who grows the food and then who packages it, who sells it, who cleans the grocery stores. Um, and then before, you know, who's the Uber delivery driver who brings it to your house? So for our members, right, what we're talking about is one systemic change is the idea of a single tier immigration system, which is to say that every time someone enters the country, they come with full citizenship rights, right? That means access to education, healthcare, decent work. Basically right now, one in 23 people in Canada are migrants. That's 1.6 million people who don't have permanent residency rights and aren't able to, and don't have the same ability to move, the same ability to survive during a pandemic. And so we're saying everybody in the country must have the same status. It is a very basic concept. You know, fair society is equal rights. Equal rights is equal status. Single tier citizenship and those who arrive in the future arrive with permanent residence. Okay? So you don't have these layers. Um, but and we have to ask, why is it? Whose interest does it serve to have a section of your society? The ones who grow your food do not have any rights. And that is what white supremacist capitalism looks like. It actually requires and forces our people to be without rights by creating an immigration policy. So what is a very basic idea, fair society, equal rights, status for all, has to be fundamentally uh, about changing the entire nature of immigration and food production. Because we can't have, I mean, Don was talking about food sovereignty, uh, when there's only five supermarkets that control 95% of all food sales, right? Like we have to reimagine first understand how it's working and then change it. And I think one step towards that is the, uh, is the idea of just basic equal rights for all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, for Rich, who is, who has some fabulous backgrounds, I've uh, been paying attention to the catalog of backgrounds uh, that you've been sifting through um, as the spokesperson for all white men, kidding. Um, for, for, for someone who is, you know, uh, a white man in, in, a, in a leadership position at the uh, Center for Regional Food Systems at an academic institution, what do you think you can do or, or are doing in, in being an ally to BIPOC folks when it comes to food systems? And what do you think it's important when it comes to doing your part and recognizing and helping to dismantle white supremacy in the food system? Like, what do you think your role is in, in all of this? I think for starters, uh, white leaders in the, the food system need to, under, to, to really get a grip and understand the his, both the historical context that is fostered and continues to foster uh, white supremacy in our food system. And that's, that includes, you know, we've been talking about, well, these, are, these are systemic issues. That, so it's our institutions, our business, our government, you know, they've all worked together to, to create this system. So, um, you know, helping to, to foster this understanding was one of the starting places that we, uh, at our small center that, at uh, Michigan State that we did. We, you know, we continue to do our internal work and we continue to acknowledge that we, uh, as even though we're trying and we're being uh, good allies, we continue to uh, fail uh, uh, BIPOC people in, in our backyard. But uh, as examples, you know, we started, uh, we're, we're now on the eighth edition of the annotated bibliography on structural racism in the US food system. And just, this is something we could do. We could pull together 
all that, all the, the resources, not, I'm not talking just about journal articles. I'm talking about people writing books uh, that the, there's, there's rich literature on all of this and we needed to make it much more available so that more people, not only, not only white leaders would read it, but more people would write about it. We actually, we use citation software so people can just go in there and, and write their, their, their stuff and cite all those cool things that, that we wanna to cite to be able to, to tell the story. And I think second, the, there's something that I've come to grips with and I think more white leaders need to come to grips with. And, and that's this idea of, the best word to describe it term is called white universalism. And that, that's this, per, this, this thinking that perpetuates with, uh, with, uh, with white leaders that white led solutions to the problems are gonna work for other races and cultures. And since we, uh, uh, white led institutions control the system, that's what we wind up having. And so the, the, this universalism approach uh, is, is part of the problem. And it's, it is such a fundamental shift in thinking that needs to happen from birth onwards. And uh, I think you know, what this means for, for us as leaders is to move from being gatekeepers and, and controlling a lot of these programs around healthy food access and uh, healthy um, uh, food incentives to uh, looking at uh, the, the programs from the standpoint of not being gatekeepers and actually trying to move that narrative and move where the, the, the engagement points are from just issues of healthy food access to, to, to ownership of land and community assets, of food sovereignty and food justice. And um, that's that's still going to take a lot of work, but that's, I, I think that's the challenge we face. And when I talk to other white uh, food leaders, that's what we talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for the people tuning in and would like to know more about the racial equity in the food system work group that Rich is part of, uh, just Google racial equity in the food system uh, work group. It'll take you to their site. And I've actually uh, was watching a few of the webinars on there and they're really, really, um, surprisingly fun to watch for what for like a, for a PowerPoint or something that's loaded with PowerPoints. It's oddly fascinating. And I mean that in the most flattering way as possible. Thank you. Um, and then I'm opening my next question to any and, and all of our panelists. Um, I mean, back, back in June, we saw a lot of black squares on Instagram from businesses, community organizations, charities and whatnot in support of Black Lives Matter. Um, whether we saw any acknowledgement of structural racism or action plans to address white supremacy internally within those organizations, you know, it's kind of a crickets situation. Um, to give a personal example, I have a friend who's an editor of a publication. When I asked them whether they'd be seeking more uh, BIPOC contributors, um, they said, oh, it's too hard because there's this whole process of recruitment and it's up to the higher ups, yada, yada, yada. It's surely, you know, it's not helping anything and just perpetuating the problem, right? Just saying that it's too hard. It's, it's too much work. I recognize it, but da -da 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 -da. anyone want to chime in about what your response would be when people are like, it's too hard. It's too long. I don't have the resources to do this. Well, they're doing it. <laughs> they're, they're doing it and it's being done. It's just being very systematically positioned to a very specific segment of the population. The infrastructure is there, the systems are there, the payroll program is there, the accountants are there, the lawyers are there, the executives are there, the building is there, the Wi-Fi is there, the everything they need to make this thing happen. They're basically saying we don't have good enough mind and management to think our way out of problems. Okay, well, since you've now uh, admitted to that, change your mind and management. Clearly, you can't problem solve because it's, it, it's so rudimentary. All of the infrastructure is there. You say something like that and it just makes me think, wow, they're basically just admitting to you that they're going to be bold face racist to your face and don't care and they're going to tell you about it. It's it's absolutely ludicrous and and it just shows you how far 
the the distance is still yet to travel. That's like me saying, I have a car, I got wheels, I got gas, you're dying and need to go to the hospital, but it's too hard because I, I can't pick up your body to put it into the car. Yeah. It's, it's ludicrous, it's ludicrous. If yeah. the will is there to lift the body and put it in the car, you will find the will to put that body in the car and use your infrastructure to get that person to the hospital. But if you are have no intent to save lives or to affect lives impacting them in a positive way, then you are making a very conscious decision to not play that game. And then that tells me everything I need to know about you and your corporation and I'm going elsewhere because this is a waste of time. Anyone else want to chime in? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a way to talk about white supremacy with those in power, but I think for us, our focus, of course, is on working class people and on our own base. And when we talk to working class people, I think we need to talk about white supremacy as a strategy of division, right? Not just something that it hurts them, right? Also, not because it's in our self-interest, but we believe in building a fair society. And those at the top use white supremacy as a way to make us fight at the bottom of the barrel for scraps. They want homeless people to hate refugees. They want workers in a factory and in a line to compete against each other. And so for us, we need to say, you know, forget, I'm, I, I'm not interested in changing the minds at the top. I'm interested in seizing power at the bottom for all of us, for the world we want to build in. And we can only do that when we start unifying and, uh, and identifying racism, not just as a privilege that you have to, you know, give away, uh, but also as a strategic set of uh, institutions and that we have to uh, build a common front and uh, you know, working class common front to seize back power, whether that is in terms of democratizing control over the land, or you know, as Don says, you know, we, land does not belong to people, we must belong to it. But that can happen when we unify at the bottom. And I think we need to really transform our focus uh, because the majority of us aren't actually, you know, the editor or those at the top, but, but there are working class people who have been uh, instilled into the mode of white supremacy. And it is our work um, tactically and strategically and effectively to build uh, our power and our alliances because it, they won't give us the end of white supremacy. We will have to create it. And so to create it, we just need a lot more power. You know, in the context of Canada, 30% of the people are in BIPOC. Right. We, we've got to get some of that 70 percent fighting with us and, you know, and, and doing it in the most radical, transformative way possible. Um, and I think that should be our approach. Yeah. Yeah. Rich, Don. Uh, yeah. Any, any, uh, any uh, want to chime in or should I move on to the next? Oh, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, Don. Yeah, I'd like to chime in. Um, we're living in extraordinary times, obviously. We've, we're um, experiencing, um, I think there would be, uh, I think most people can see the crises of not just like the public health crisis with COVID, but um, the climate crisis, the economic fallout of both of those crises and the ongoing destruction of the beauty of this planet, the heritage. I mean, how much more is it going to take um, before people realize themselves more fully in, in this story and, and this reality? And I think, I feel like the potential um, is infinite to be able to make change. And as indigenous peoples, we know like our, our, our knowledge system is based on a transformative methodology, on a transformative worldview. It's so different from the Western science-based techno-bureaucratic framework for research and development um, that plays a role in the movement and making the change, but it's not, it's not the ultimate voice of truth and reason. Um, this is not a controlled experiment. It's beyond anything we've ever experienced as humans. And I, I feel like in order to, to be able to adapt and to make the necessary changes quickly, humans have to realize our potential and break free from the hierarchies that have conditioned us and colonized our bodies, our minds, our spirits, 
it's the production paradigm has mechanized the spirit and the soul out of the land and food system. And it's based on a production, a Cartesian worldview, a mechanistic worldview um, that was instituted in the industrial revolution. That production paradigm has reached the limits of its growth. Um, we cannot sustain um, the, our livelihoods. Um, our, my daughter, she's 30 years old. I, you know, I think about her life in 30 years and what is that going to be like? The health of the land and the plants and the animals and the people. Um, it's very clear the evidence shows that um, ever since agriculture was first introduced 10, 11, 12,000 years ago, um, it's led to the decline of health of humans and ecosystems. We need a totally different way of thinking about our food. And I'm not professing that everybody go out and become hunters and gatherers because indigenous peoples don't even have access to enough of that food anymore. It's quite sad. Um, and yet the indigenous food systems are the remaining fragments of the last biodiversity and cultural heritage on this planet. Um, and there's not even enough to feed us. And so, um, you know, I think people are waking up to realize themselves in this crisis, but rather than um, thinking that, oh, it's too big to do anything about, um, it's more about coming back to our own inner selves and realizing our power. Because um, I agree with what um, Syed said about that, like the, the power is in the people and we've given much too much power to these structures, um, these governments and corporations. And while there's a lot of people in those, some of those places that are wanting to change as well, um, we still need to, it comes down to our own economy and, you know, subsistence economies have been around on the planet for 90% of the time humans have existed on the planet and any anthropological texts will speak of it that way. Um, and they still exist, like the giving, the sharing, the trading, the cooperating. Um, those are the real economies that I think to put our power in that, maybe in a way COVID is giving us an opportunity to do that because we're seeing that the economy is shifting, the capitalist economy, which is where racism and white supremacy is most evident both, both in capitalist economies and agriculture are probably the biggest ways that we see white supremacy being um, being expressed. So, yeah, I think it's just that um, really looking at that, really activating those um, economy, economies of mutual aid and solidarity and really um, looking at what that means just to be a human in that in these powerful times. Is, is, yeah. I think what you've said kind of gives me a good segue into my next question for you, Don. Um, in June, there was a piece um, about you in the National Observer, um, and it talked about your work with the Indigenous Food and Freedom School. For those who aren't familiar with that, could you talk about, about what that program is and what it aims to do? Yeah, the Indigenous Food and Freedom School is the latest of our strategies um, um, and it are projects. And the the main idea is to it well, it's it's a concept that was modeled after the Freedom School concept developed by um, African Americans in the late 1660s. And my uncle Mike Arnous, um, a Shikwetmuk elder, um, was involved with the American Indian in American Indian movement back in the 1960s and traveled a lot in the US and got to know a lot of different uh, Black Panthers and Red Berets and, and different people of color and some of the poor working class white people at the time who were mobilizing under the term rainbow coalitions. Um, so people of all colors, similar to the way Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela coined the term rainbow nations in South Africa um, to mobilize the people of color there. Um, that's kind of the concept where my uncle Mike talked about that history and I'm like, well, that's what we want to do. We want to develop a freedom school and, um, and focus on indigenous leadership and um, increasing our capacity to, 
to lead, um, to be able to articulate plans and proposals for Indigenous food sovereignty, to be able to grow more food, to share more food, to really understand what it likes, bring ours back together in that um, uh, solidarity economy and um, the gifting economy. And, and so we, are, um, we got three years of funding um, to develop it and test it and evaluate it. And we've acquired land and we've um, started uh, developing the infrastructure, getting infrastructure in place so that we can um, grow food and share it and trade it. We've got two cohorts. We've got one in Chase in Shikwatmakuluk, um, my home community, um, the Nesconeth Indian Reserve and prime agricultural land where we have elk um, coming back to the valley after they were extirpated and overhunted at the time of colonization. So we are mapping out and advocating for Shikwetmuk foodlands conservation area that overlaps with not just the agricultural land, but decolonizes that narrative to extend beyond to our hunting corridors of elk migration and wild salmon migration. And um, yeah, and just regenerating and activating all that knowledge around it and um, just bringing, uh, bringing us back to that kind of decolonizing process of let's tell our own story. Um, we also have a cohort in east side of Vancouver, um, which is many people probably know one of the most poverty stricken neighborhoods in all of Canada and um, really uh, a serious uh, opioid crisis. Um, and we were awarded a residency by the Vancouver Parks Board in um, the Strathcona Park, which is a historical park with a lot of social justice activism, people of color um, over the years. And um, the Vancouver Parks Board has accepted our vision to restore indigenous food lands in the park. Um, and they put it into their capital planning budget, um, upcoming capital planning budget. And so we're working with, um, right now there's a big um, action happening there. Um, a lot of homeless people in the city have set up a uh, tent city and they're now living in our park. We probably have about 300 tents, um, people, homeless people living there. And so we're really looking at it, engaging them in this project to restore indigenous food lands. And so that's another way that the Food and Freedom School is developing and and um, yeah, so there's more. Uh, we're developing a toolkit as well that'll be available for people. That's fantastic. And then, so again, just returning to the theme of power and, and ownership for uh, non policy, you know, we talked a bit about, a, we, we talked a lot about um, land ownership and what needs to be done from a government level to make these. Um, actual tangible changes. Um, so in South Africa, like what's happening with the levels of government there when it comes to racial inequalities in the food system and the disparity in land ownership? Is there anything being done right now to address that? Or if not, what, what needs to be done? Well, what I could say is, uh, excuse me, right now, there's so much talk about it. land, people getting land, and uh, expropriation without compensation, which is a, you know, in, in, in everybody's lips now and so on. But um, very little is actually happening. And I just want to, to tell you a, a story. One time, there was this, uh, we, we were at a meeting, and then there was this lady who is doing poultry. She's a farmer doing poultry. And one time she confronted a, 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 a feed distributor about the quality of the food that she, he was selling to her and all that. And what happened after that was that this this uh, this this distributor or this shop owner 
did not want to sell her anything, but not telling her directly, I'm not going to sell you anymore. Said, no, whenever she came and said, I want this, said, no, we're out of stock. No, we're out of stock. No, we're out of stock. Because she just confronted her. So that uh, sometimes, even if farmers wanted to do something, sometimes they find it very difficult because they don't have the whole chain. It's very easy for those who own things to kind of cut you off one way or another. So it's very difficult Some, so that the farmers have to go maybe through the government and say, this is what we need and what we're writing and so on. And the government has really good policies, but then policy alone is not, very, is not that wonderful because it won't do things. It won't change people. It won't change things. You know, so there's that, you know, kind of difficulty when it comes to that. Even one farmer see that this is what we need. This is what we need to do. And now where they'll come with with all the policies, you know, being, being politicians, of course, and they'll give you all the promises and so on, but nothing really happens. There's little here and there, here and there. But at the same time, they might, they could give you land. And after they've given you land, what do you do with the land? if you don't have the money. Mm. And sometimes you find that even when they want to help you with all these things and say, well, we're going to fund you this, fund you with that, fund you with that, it's too little to be effective in any way. Okay, they fund you with that, they fund you with that. And then what happens next? You don't have a market. And then those who own the market, they will say, okay, we do have so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so but they only take one ton from you and uh, 50 tons will come from the white farmer. So there's that inequality and uh, these statistics, you know, well, I take from so many farmers and our government many a time will not make the follow up. They don't do the follow up to find out, okay, you take from so much from this farmer, this black farmer, this black farmer, how much, how often, and that, causes problems because there's so much statistics, you know, that they are giving out, no, we're helping these people with what we're doing and so on and so on. And market is crucial and fi finance is crucial. Yeah. So there's difficulty, they, you know, promises, empty promises sometimes. They do help here and there, but it's not even, they need to change the strategy. Yeah. And, and we need- What would be step one? one? I know there's so many things that need to be fixed, but what's the first step that governments in South Africa can do to help, um, you know, black farmers and uh, and to kind of help with the disparity? What's what's like the first step that governments? The first step is to develop new policies, new kind of models, economic models that work that mm -hmm. will work, and chalk to the farmers. That's mm -hmm. the first step. Yeah. That we try this, we try this, it did not work. Yeah. How do you think we should approach this? Mm -hmm. What model can we put in? Have a model here, they, and see how it works. That's the first step. Mm -hmm. Have a model and yeah. see how it works and then take it from there. Not to just come and give people you're making people in I mean, dependent on you that no, the government is going to give us this, is going to give us this. No, not give, give, give. What's the model? What model are you following? Mm -hmm. And how successful is it? And it's going to be different models for different communities because we are not all the same. We don't think all the same and we're in different areas and in different things. So that I think that's the first step. Talk yes. to us, yes. talk with us, yes. discuss, have models yeah. that's and, work. Yeah. And to kind of continue with the theme of the, having that open dialogue and that uh, openness and transparency, this question is for uh, Rich. I mean, you spend a lot of your time um, as your as a role in Michigan State as a mentor to support food system leaders interested in equity um, in their approach to work. Are there any people that you draw inspiration from or take a lot of direction from people that you kind of look up to in a way and have a lot of these back and forth with to kind of um, steer you on the right track or to make sure that 
you know, you're keeping your ears open and the, the research that you're doing is, the, is getting the, re the results that you want. I, what, there are organizations, you know, farmers organizations and farmers groups where we talk and we look at things and how things could be done and all that. But at the same time, you find that uh, sometimes, like I said, um, there's got to be different models. You find that one person did that and it worked for her. And then you look at, it, at that person and look up to that person, but then the situations are different, yeah. you know? So you, you cannot say, you, you may look up to that person, get inspired right enough, but then where are you, who are you, where are you from, your background and everything. So there are all those, you know, different things yeah. that you need to look at to be able to move forward. Yeah. And then I guess- But then there are those that have made it really, that you yeah. can say, this one, I want to be there, you know, because we're following so and so, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, I guess the same uh, question for uh, Rich. Were there, are there any uh, people or resources that you kind of consulted a lot and done a lot of back and forth that kind of helped with uh, your research that you do at Michigan State? There are well, organizations, the organizations that do come to help. <laughs> yes, they are. Okay. There are organizations that do come to help, that will assist you, that will take you far, you know, that will actually go and do what the, 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 the government hasn't actually done. You know, uh, like we do have an organization that you know, helps farmers and uh, with you know, the a farmer to market kind of organization, you know, and they actually go there and actually get you the contracts because that is what we don't get. We never get any contracts. They say, no, you are too risky, you know, because you're very inconsistent and something like that. But then with their assistance and with negotiating with these people, then you do get what you want. You know, it, it helps in a, in a, in a, in a quite a number of ways. And even in the government, sometimes we, I mean, you cannot say they are all the same. There are those who will, you know, go out of their way to assist you with whatever you need, get you information if you need information. You know, they really go out of their way and assist you. But then sometimes you find that it's only those that are down there. There isn't much that they can do because up there, I mean, you, you cannot get something. And then uh, next question for Mr. Pirag. Um, in our, in um, your, your research and the work that you do at Michigan State, are there any people that you consulted a lot with or you draw inspiration from uh, through your work at the um, Regional Food Systems Equity um, Center? Yes. Uh the, the, the center is the racial equity in the food system work group that you had mentioned and that I put information in the chat pod. You know, we've, there's, there's about 20 people from around the country. The, most of the people are BIPOC. Uh, I'm the only white male. And I get a lot of inspiration from, from their stories and, and their work. And uh, I also I just would say that I I'm very uh, lucky uh, with our our staff at uh, the center. They're they're very passionate about wanting to make a change uh, to be a, a uh, an anti-racist organization. And um, I also just wanted to also uh, mention that uh, there's been leaders at the national level, uh, represent in in the U.S. and other countries that I just feel very. Um, very fortunate to have gotten to know just even a little bit. Uh, and uh, those people have uh, meant a, a great deal uh, to me, both here in Michigan, people like Malik Kikini in Detroit, Ricardo Salvador at the Union of Concerned Scientists, just to name a uh, few people. And uh, there aren't as many other old uh, white male that identify as male leaders that I can uh, speak with, but there are a few and that has been, that has been helpful. Uh, if there's any of them out there listening, contact me. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, for Roger, kind of back into the world of uh, restaurants, which seems like such a foreign concept to <laughs> me right now, the idea of eating inside a restaurant. Um, back in June, I interviewed um, a Toronto chef, Bashir Manier, friend to Food Share, uh, for a piece where he talked about where a lot of foods that you see on menus um, in North American restaurants are kind of 
presented in a very colonialist Eurocentric lens. Mm -hmm. Like it, the, the way that the food is prepared, the way that it's written on the menu, the way that um, uh, restaurants are designed from the decor to the music, it's very Eurocentric and is catering to a, a, a white audience. And that uh, culinary students are taught French cooking terms and the French way of running a kitchen you know, with, ro with uh, roles like sous chef, chef de partie, chef de cuisine. Um, fine dining is equated with French cooking and Italian cooking, while, you know, Chinese food or uh, Ghanaian cooking is presented as cheap eats, even if it's just as labor intensive or that the ingredients, you know, cost the same. Do you agree with what uh, Chef Bashir said? Um, in that there's a disparity in the way that different cuisines are are viewed and, and presented um, in restaurant cultures here in the West. Yeah, for sure. And I think that just underlines like how how that, how pervasive systemic systemic racism is in our society, right? It really is like you say that mindset. It's that mindset that would I rather spend $20 for a dish that I can get in Scarborough for $6, right? That's, that's effectively what you're, what you're getting at. Yeah. yeah. So, and it's that yes or no. Yes. Am I off, off base here? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that, that is, it really is truly just a testament to how deeply embedded the, the, the systemic racism is in the mindset of, of the society at large, you know? Um, how do we combat that? How do we battle that? Um, for me, I, I've always made a point of making sure that I can integrate um, make dishes, you know, we sell one of my best selling and I do this as, a, as experimental things too. So when I first started with the airport restaurant, they would tell me we can't do pancakes because there's not enough room on the flat top, for instance. And I'm like, okay, cool. First thing we're going to add on the menu is pancakes, right? Okay. So that, that's just to illustrate a, a, the system breaking mentality. But, you know, one of our highest selling items on my restaurant, and, and we focus on North American comfort foods with a global twist, right, um, is, is this fried chicken. Or we do this um, samosas, classic Indian samosas with tamarind and mint chutney. And I put those things on the menu and I price them like you would price them on Queen Street, not in Little India, right? And I do that almost as an experiment to see, okay, uh, the mindset going into this whole venture was that, you know, people like their burgers and their fries when they go to the airport, that's a, now when I look at our menu mix, I see the menu mix is the samosas are the highest selling items, this fried chicken with all these like Southeast Asian in, uh, influences on it. And all of the, the stuff like the burgers are towards the mid and bottom of the, of the sales mix of it. Right. And I think it's just this slow, again, slow, gradual, representation that you just have to kind of integrate gradually into people's mindset to be able to make that shift in the turn and the understanding because yo these restaurants are in scarborough or little india they're paying exorbitant rent in the gta their insurance is the same their employee payrolls are the same they have to pay the same cpp and ei contributions the same taxes to the government they need that extra those extra dollars per menu item and and i think it's it's just a matter of of perception and really indoctrinating the minds of the people in a totally different way you just have to turn the corner and just do it you mm -hmm. have to put your money where your mouth is and just do it and take the risk and just do it and 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 treat it with the same reverence and train the staff so you know when we train the staff we do this is a samosa this is what's in the samosa the same way when you go to queen street west or parkdale or the drake and you ask them oh what is mct oil or oh, whatever whatever it is right and they'll give you this long diatribe about the benefits of it and we do all of that 
Then we do it with the samosa. We do it with the Asian influenced fried chicken. We do it and we tell them the story so they understand the history, the legacy, the amount of work that goes into it, what we're trying to do from a cultural perspective and they buy into it. And they're happy to, to get that thing at the airport and have a, a good experience and have a samosa, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it really is just just fighting, fighting to do it and doing it. And if I wasn't at the table to have that fight, I don't know if it would happen, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm there, it goes back to representation, having that voice at the table who has a decision-making influence of power to be able to say, this is what we're going to do. And this, I'm gonna show you how to do it. I'm gonna hold your hand. I'm gonna guide and lead the team. And we're gonna do this together and it's gonna be great. And it just is, just you just gotta fight for it and do it. but you have to have a vested interest to want to fight, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure that a lot of people who have been tuning in to this Zoom slash Facebook um, chat have been very invigorated by the things that the five of you have said in the last hour or so. For this question is for Saeed. During the last months, a lot of the public has been more aware of what migrant workers are going through, um, not just through, through uh, COVID, but, you know, long, long, long before that. And they might be very invigorated to kind of do something about it. They want to do something, but they're not, as Roger said, they don't have, the, they don't necessarily have the seat at the table to make those uh, decisions. So what can regular people do to advocate for migrant worker justice? Or, you know, if they're part of a food organization or, or like, what can that organization do? What can people do to kind of help the cause that that you're working towards so i mean the first thing i would say is right now canada in canada the parliament is prorogued and the federal liberals have said that they're going to come back on september 23rd with a new vision for the 99 percent they're going to build back a just equitable society you know all of these big words uh, but that also means that there is a moment when and, and because they're in a minority position what they announce on that day they need the NDP at least, or the bloc or the conservatives to vote for them, otherwise we will have an election. So there is this moment when actually broad transformative ideas could be pushed. And you could say to the liberals who really wanna stay in power that we actually want you to bring something substantive. And that for us is full and permanent immigration status for all. So we would encourage people to first and foremost, you know, sign our petition, it's migrantrights.ca slash COVID-19. Uh, I'll drop it in the chat in a moment uh, to sign that, but also then to reach out to their members of parliament, whoever they are and say, I am going to be looking to see that you make status for all part of your discussion. You know, food organizations of all kinds can be issuing statements right now, tagging the prime minister saying, want full and permanent immigration status for all. Uh, any, um, uh, you know, we are having, you know, every, if you go to our website or our Facebook, you'll see, you know, farm workers are speaking out. They are taking action. Uh, they just need support. You know, people are already fighting for themselves. We have, you know, farm workers who were fired, for example, for speaking to the press. And instead of going quietly, they refused to get on the plane. Uh, they, in fact, sued the employer. They're doing, uh, they showed up unmasked outside of the Minister of Immigration's office to, in the face of, you know, threat of deportation to deliver a letter to him. So migrants are taking charge, migrants are moving. And what we need people is to amplify those voices. And so following on social media uh, and amplifying those voices, but migrantrights.ca slash COVID-19, but really to think about the next 28 days or the next 30 days when the liberals will bring back something. This is the moment. If we can't win some substantive shift in immigration, you know, 20 years ago, 60,000 people used to come to the country on temporary permits. In 2018, it was 750,000 new permits issued. We have shifted towards a system of temporary immigration policy and people have noticed. And that has been accompanied by a reduction in rights and the inability of people to protect themselves. So that's what I think really people need to do. Issue statements, speak out publicly, call for status for all, use every and all means at your disposal uh, to do that. Um, and, and I just wanna say, you know, lots of people reach out to us and say, hey, can we donate? Uh, frankly, that's not what workers are need needing for. People are saying, hey, what about boycotts? You know, can we find a good employer? And we keep saying, look, there are good employers who do bad things. There are bad employers who do good things. That's not what it's about. What we need is a set of laws and policies to make sure that those bad practices don't happen. 
you know, there isn't currently a call for a boycott. Uh, there aren't really, you know, as I said, the vast majority of food is grown by farm workers. You can't really just, you, most people just aren't rich enough to not buy from people. You know, that's not an option. So I think we need people to instead of try, just be like, change the laws, change the policies, force the federal government. Really, we have this window until September 23rd when the liberals are promising change. They're saying, we're gonna recover from COVID-19. Yeah. Let's tell them what the price of that would be. We have to set the price for the liberals to ward off an election. Uh, and, and I think we need to do that now. Okay, all right. Okay, I, I know in the last hour and a half has been pretty heavy. It's hard to cover centuries of systematic oppression in an hour and a half <laughs> talk. Um, but I kind of wanted to end things kind of on a hopeful note. I know we're kind of uh, pressed for time. And if I was known Olisi, I would be brushing my teeth and getting ready for bed now where she is. Um, so I just want to go down the line of my five uh, panelists and just tell me in one or two sentences, if there's anything, any takeaways, any little glimmers of hope, any little signs of positive change that you see has been happening with regards to food systems in where you work. Um, let's start with uh, Don. You can also pass. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, there's, I, I think there, there's a huge shift. Um, well, there's a whole, huge movement. I'm excited about the huge movement um, towards regenerative farming. I'm also can't seem to keep up to the number of responses and requests um, of, of people of all color who want to, uh, to work in solidarity and know how to, to follow indigenous matriarchal leadership in that process. I'm, um, and I guess just um, thinking about the decolonizing food system uh, cross-cultural interface framework we developed which is a tool to actually, it's a transformative engagement tool um, that can help us bring us through a process of understanding the different ways that reality is expressed in the food system from our respective cultures. And through that process um, lands us at a place where we can identify the potential that exists within the gaps of the unknown, the gaps of knowledge across cultures. Okay. I think there's infinite potential and I have a lot of hope for that. And that's where the, the strategies are. So I look forward to opportunities to be able to work with all of the amazing panelists here. I'm really grateful for this opportunity and thank you because I know how important the relationships are to build to build and to, to kind of keep showing up to this work and thinking of it all as both and we can do we can do it all right so thank yeah. you yeah. and uh rich any um anything that's kind of driving you in the work that you do we are starting to 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 really s start conversations about uh, what power sharing models would look like uh, uh and by that i mean i'll give you a very concrete example and the the you always hear about well, uh, white food system leaders need to invite uh, uh, BIPOC leaders to the table. That paradigm needs to shift where the, the BIPOC leaders are setting the table and inviting uh, white food system leaders to that table. That, that's where we need to move the, discu the discussion to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, Norm Alisi, uh, what's kind of driving you uh, as a farmer? What's kind of keeping you going? Um, first of all, I would like to say <clears throat> I'm excited about the fact that they, I got into a platform like this. There are people who are vocal about the current situation. And uh, I would say, you know, it, it, it really excites me, uh, the fact that many Black people are trying to move towards feeding themselves. Home gardens, you know, even urban farming. At least just that, it, 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 it's doing a lot. 
because many of our children, I mean, they had no idea even where the milk came from, you know, things like those, or where the tomato came from and so on. So little things like those. And uh, also one other thing that is exciting me at the moment is that we stopped looking at, you know, what we are doing now, but we are looking at the bigger picture. And one of the exciting things at the moment is that people have begun to look at, no man, these um, seeds and so on, what is happening to our indigenous seeds? If we don't have these seeds, we don't keep our indigenous seeds. They are taking them GMO, hybrids and everything. Then they are going to have all the seeds and we won't have any. And then we'll be dependent on them for the rest of our lives and for generations to come. So those things that we're looking at the bigger picture now as farmers kind of makes me, you know, you know, we have that oomph to move forward. Say, oh yeah, we're getting there. No matter how little, one step at a time, we are getting there. I think excitement is a good word uh, to kind of describe the sentiment um, that we kind of want to end on. Roger, is there anything that um, that's kind of driving you or that you're, you're even the most quasi semi hopeful about when it comes to the hospitality industry or food media? Uh, you know, I'm encouraged to see, you know, we have this beautiful panel of people here, all experts in their field. Everybody's been fighting in their own way for a long time, right? Um, and I'm encouraged to see professionals and experts in their aspects of their fields voicing their opinion and expressing that. But what I find very encouraging is this conversation is now extended to the community at large. When I posted about this conversation, it wasn't industry people who were responding en masse to me. It was the average person who was like, yo, I'm joining this, I'm gonna jump in on this thing. The average person in the community has entered this conversation. And whether that's COVID, Black Lives Matter, all of these issues kind of coming together to create this perfect storm at this perfect moment where everybody is considering every aspect of their lives on a very visceral level, but also uh, in a very tangible way to you and your neighbors personally, right? This is not, uh, yes, it is a big systemic conversation. That's what we're having here. But this conversation is now happening with my neighbor across the street. I tell you, I did not have this conversation with my neighbor across the street two months ago. <laughs> right? <laughs> and here we are. This, this conversation is coming to the fore in the community in a very substantive way. And that gives me a lot of hope. And if I could speak to my man Sayed over here, he says the power is not at the top, the power is with the people. The power is always with the people. Right now we're talking, the Raptors are talking about boycotting the playoffs, right? There is no NBA if the players do not play. <laughs> there's, there's no food system if the, my neighbor and me decide not to buy that X item in the grocery store. That item no longer exists. So the power is with us, with everybody. Everybody shopping in the grocery store, everybody walking their dog, walking their kids, and this is the conversation. So we may have a panel of, of professionals and experts here, but the people who are listening are not professionals and experts, they're the common person. And that is a new thing and that gives me a lot of hope because if we could centralize the power of all the people, there's only 0.0001% of the population who governs the society. The society holds control. And if people embrace and understand and collectively mobilize around that notion, and it takes a little bit of sacrifice, but if everybody's willing to do that, oh my God, we're gonna steamroll the whole shit. <laughs> All right, Syed, you take us home. You, uh, is there anything that's kind of encouraging amidst the mess? <laughs> I spoke to this before, and I'll just say it again. You know, right now, for example, we had a 1,000 migrant farm workers call and leave a message for Prime Minister Trudeau. These are people who risk not being able to come back in the future. 200 people took photos of themselves holding up a sign saying status for all 
50 of those workers did so unmasked and we stuck those posters to every inch of Prime Minister Trudeau's office in Montreal. We um, have seen over and over again that migrants are taking risks. Undocumented people are taking to the streets. On Sunday, we had an action where people blocked the road just outside of the immigration offices in downtown Toronto. Migrants, undocumented people in the face of detentions, deportations, you know, employer abuse, bad housing are choosing to bravely take action. And not just on the streets, but also, you know, our fundamental power is that is our ability to stop the flow of capital, right? To stop the flow of profit. So when people stop a the street, they're actually stopping the normal functioning of society. But migrant farm workers have been having wildcat strikes, refusing to work until they got adequate food because they're not being getting any food. They're not allowed off the farms uh, to go to the grocery store because of COVID, but then there's no food for them. So we see all of these inspiring actions where, you know, these are primarily Caribbean and Latino men. These are black and brown men, also lots of women who are taking incredible action. Um, and we don't see that. We hear a lot of stories about how bad the situation is. Uh, and, you know, media prefers to tell these sad stories. But for me, I am wake up every day to hear dozens of stories of incredible courage uh, and resilience that we should be inspired by, uh, even in the face of a public health pandemic that is literally killing our people. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all. I'm sure if we kept this conversation going, we'll be here till the next morning. Um, we've already gone way over. So thank you all so much for participating in this chat. Um, before we close, um, I'd like to thank our panelists once again, Don Morrison, Roger Mooking, Saeed Hussain, Noam Olisi Mate, and Rich Pirog. Thank you all for sharing your experience, your wisdom, your expertise, and just keep doing the work that you're doing. Because obviously, as we know now, there's a sold out audience for it. Um, huge thanks to our interpreters from the Toronto Sign Language Interpreter Service who provided ASL interpretation for today's panel. So yay! Um, and also Megan Leonard, the illustrator responsible for the poster of all our beautiful faces. Uh, Leslie Campbell from Food Share for reaching out to everyone and organizing this. Uh, Kari for doing the socials for Food Share. Uh, Paul Taylor for his leadership at Food Share. Uh, Peter for doing all the tech work. Um, this is the first Zoom meeting where I didn't crash and I got to log in on time. So <laughs> that's big compliments from me. Um, you know, I believe the work that's being done and the conversations being held are just vital in opening our eyes and just knowing that change is necessary and possible. And for all of our panelists here, just showing us exactly what needs to be done. Um, just a bit of housekeeping and some final words. Um, Food Share and Food Network Canada will continue to advance these kind of conversations. So please consider a donation to Food Share Toronto to help Food Share continue to do the amazing work advancing food justice. And your contributions help Food Share bring together events like today's fabulous panel, as well as support the development of community led food infrastructure like urban farms affordable produce markets, and a wealth of programs, some of which I've written before, do a Google search on it. Um, you can support FoodShare by donating at foodshare.net. And if you live in Toronto, you can support FoodShare by signing up for FoodShare's Good Food Box program at goodfoodbox.foodshare.net. Um, some of my coworkers and friends actually um, subscribe to the box and I've heard nothing but good things about it. You can also follow Food Share Toronto and Food Network Canada on social uh, media uh, for more details on the next panel that they're organizing. I mean, they have a very tough act to follow after us. So <laughs> good luck, guys. Um, but anyways, have a good one, everyone. Enjoy what's left of summer for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere. And yes, take care, everyone. Thank you all again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye.